uh, today's session. And if you'd like the full e-training um, is on the website. Uh, there'll be lots of opportunities to participate in today's workshop and we've had great participation in the last couple of days. Uh, first, you can ask your questions directly to Haley about this workshop at this time in the chat and she'll answer them. And anything she can't answer will join up with a number of other questions we've received and that will be available um, <clears throat> through the protocol question and answer session tomorrow. And also, if you have additional questions, I'll tell you about that in a moment. The other way, the other way you can participate today is through linked activities. So just like you started there, you grab the link in the chat and you put it in your browser window and then you go to your own browser to participate in the activity. And when you're done, you come back to the Zoom window where you'll be able to see what everyone's been working on and we'll talk about what, um, what we've all done together. And it moves pretty quick. So um, feel free to let us know if you have missed something or you need me to slow down my talking a little bit. Sometimes I get ahead of myself, um, but the workshop is being recorded as you noticed. And so it will be available after today for you to go back and review if you've missed something. Our other trainers in the workshop <clears throat> earlier in the week were Jen Borjo, Peggy Folletta, and Mike Jabot. And they're not with us today, but you will see some of their faces and hear their voices for the protocol Q&A tomorrow if you join. So another important link is to Mentimeter. And Mentimeter is a place where you can put in your questions um, that are lingering after today's workshop, as well as any questions you have specifically about the carbon cycle introductory module, which you might have participated in before this workshop. Um, we won't have time to answer those here, but we wanted to give you the opportunity to ask those questions. So why are we all here today? Um, it's important to remember why we do GLOBE and why we collect carbon data in particular. And <clears throat> I just wanted to remind you that scientists collect carbon cycle data on a global scale in smaller ecosystems um, because they want to know how those ecosystems will respond to warmer temperatures and higher carbon dioxide levels. And in particular, carbon cycle data collected with GLOBE will contribute to a better understanding of the relationship between carbon storage by plants and surface climate. So it gives you that micro scale visibility. Um, and that data may be used by your own students, communities, um, as well as possible scientists at a future time. We don't have a current um, field campaign, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be one. So like all good um, teachers, um, it's really a great idea to focus any work you're gonna do with GLOBE using a research question to sort of drive how you collect data and how you understand it. So today's research question that's gonna focus our workshop is how do differences in tree species and sample site type affect carbon storage near where I live? So let that sink in for a moment. How do differences in tree species and sample site type affect carbon storage near where I live? And while there are many research questions you could ask and then use the carbon cycle protocols to answer, this is the one we've chosen for today. So how do we go about answering this question? Um, we're gonna activate our prior knowledge and we're also going to figure out what we think we need to know in order to be able to answer that question. So we're going to use something called a KWL, and it's a table where we, we know what we know, we write that down, what we want to know, and then at the end of our session today, we're going to put, it, put together what we collectively learned. So you can check out this Jamboard link in the chat, and I'll take you there now. So here. So this is what it looks like in order to participate. You grab a sticky note over here on the left, you click it open, and you type what you know or want to know, and then move it around. 
So once it pops up, you can move your boxes. And we want to hear from you now. So put that link in your browser and contribute your ideas. So I see a bunch of people here put together those ideas. We want, what do we know in order to be able to answer our research question today? And what do we want to know? So how do differences in tree species and sample site type affect carbon storage near where I live? Good, we've got somebody weighing in. Don't be afraid. I don't know who you are. This is all anonymous. Ooh, good question. Are we subdividing into deciduous and coniferous? What are different types of sample sites? Carbon is life, most definitely. We don't even mind if your English is a little funny. Join right in. Anything you can do to put together your ideas. Great question. Is there a preferable set of conditions for sampling? That's excellent. Hopefully we'll be able to answer that for you today. Ooh, will seasons matter? Carbon sequestration is a function of photosynthesis. Yes, that's some great background knowledge. When I think about carbon, I think about the ways in which it is stored. That's good, because that's the way we keep it out of the atmosphere, right? Someone does already know that different types of trees store different amounts of carbon, so maybe we can catch everybody up who does not know that yet. Mm, and a question about predicting carbon dynamics in the future. We probably won't be able to answer that question in full today, but we do have some a modeling module that will help you conceptualize that. So once you get some background today, you might feel confident in participating in that e-training. How does the rate of growth impact carbon storage? We will, we will talk a little bit about that today. Mm, a great question about unlocking carbon. Um, you'll want to participate in the GLOBE uh, carbon cycle introductory activities. We have two wonderful activities, the carbon cycle adventure story and the carbon travels game that both kind of get at where does carbon go and how does it cycle around um, within the Earth's atmosphere? Because it definitely stays with us and it does not go to space. Definitely stays in our atmosphere. Excellent. So if people continue to have ideas, you're welcome to continue to put them here. Um, this is a great tool for us too as trainers. So we copy it and save it for later to think about future workshops. So feel free to add anything else as you need to. For now, we're gonna head back to our presentation. So how are we gonna to approach today? So you were asked to do the introductory activities ahead of time if you were able. 
So we're not gonna talk about those today, but if you did not get a chance, the module is online and available for you. It takes about two hours to complete. Um, we're gonna look at and talk about some of our field learning activities, some, some pre-knowledge that you would need in order to understand what kind of data you're collecting and why. Today, we're specifically gonna look up at the site selection protocol so that you can figure out what type of sites there are and which one's most appropriate for your area. We're not gonna go through site setup or the individual protocols today um, because these are much more like some of the other GLOBE materials that exist and they're very well written up. Um, and there's uh, appropriate protocol sheets and data entry sheets that you'll be able to easily follow along if you've done GLOBE for a number of years. We are gonna focus in on some data analysis today because that seems to be, be a bit of a confusing point um, for a lot of folks. So we'll tackle that. And then we also want to know, want to let you know there are assessment tools for teachers. So we're specifically gonna address the protocol on site setup and comparing standard and non-standard field measurement sites. We're gonna do part two of a learning activity called biomass units and part two of a learning activity called allometry, not allometry, which one student so mistakenly came up with one year. And we're gonna look at a supporting protocol called biomass and carbon storage data analysis. And that's gonna be in a spreadsheet. So how do we even calculate carbon? We have to start at the beginning, right? So we are gonna measure tree circumference to answer our question, right? We are focus was on trees for this particular workshop. So we're just gonna be talking about trees mostly, um, but you might have questions that Haley can answer about non-treed sites. Um, tree circumference is what we measure. It's the same thing they measure in land cover protocols. There's also an opportunity for students to participate in an activity that helps them understand the relationship between circumference and diameter and why we wouldn't be able to measure diameter, of course, is because we don't want to have to cut down the tree. So we need to use the pi <coughs> relationship. Uh, tree circumference, how to measure trees, also allows you to um, teach students how to measure trees correctly, like the height, and then how to be precise and accurate with their measuring tools. Once you have DBH, you can calculate biomass of a tree in grams. And then from there, you can calculate carbon storage per tree. And then you can get to carbon storage for a whole area or per a standard unit, which is grams of carbon per meter squared. So we're gonna go over today, allometric equations and how to make this relationship. And we're also, we're also gonna talk about biomass and its percentage of carbon. And then also your sample site area and how you're gonna choose that and <clears throat> make a plan for your training or your teaching. And that's where we're gonna to start today. Site selection. So there are essentially two sites, two types of sites for carbon cycle protocols. Remember, for carbon cycle protocols, we're just focused on the um, terrestrial ecosystems, primarily above ground. So carbon that's stored in the vegetation that we can see all around us. So in order to select your site, um, one option is a standard site. This is most similar to uh, land cover sites. You can do a 30 by 30 meter square but you need at least 225 square meters. So a lot of people have done 15 by 15 meter areas, but if you don't have a square area, you can choose a irregular area, a circle, like maybe you have a plot from some other work that you do or that other scientists in your area do, and you can use a circular plot. It doesn't really matter as long as you have a minimum size of 225 square meters of contiguous vegetation. So that means that it's not interrupted by human-made structures. So this might be a forest, a shrubland, a grassland, or it might be a, a woodland that has a, a mixed set of vegetation types. 
A non-standard site is an area that has been impacted by human um, building or human interference. Um, <clears throat> so you can see sort of the aerial view here shows lots of trees and grasses, but it also shows these buildings which take up some amount of the square meters in your site. So they would impact the amount of carbon that's able to be stored on your site because there are existing structures that aren't vegetation. So that's gonna be a non-standard site of at least, again, 225 square meters. And it might be a local park, a city block, or the school area. Um, I wanna give you a moment now to check out this flippity and take a look at um, this, these ideas yourself. And you're gonna kind of think about it in your own mind before we talk about it. So you're gonna start by clicking on and moving the word standard to the top of one side and moving the word non-standard to the top of the other side. And then you're going to move the individual components to where you believe they should be based on what the characteristics of each type of site are. And as you're doing this, if you come up with any new questions, feel free to write them in the chat and Haley will do her best to answer them. As you're moving around the pieces, consider what you notice are the difference between standard and non-standard sites. What are the similarities? And how would those differences impact carbon storage near where you live? Just take about 20 more seconds and then we'll talk about what you all have come up with. So Take a look at a completed one here and hopefully yours looks somewhat similar. On the standard site, we have that contiguous vegetation, it could be forest or grasslands. Here we have some shrublands, an old <clears throat> evergreen forest, a grassland. Um, key pieces here are that it's greater than 225 square meters and it's accessible. But you'll notice here, this looks very straight. These rows of trees are very straight. This is a tree plantation. So it does have human interference, but it doesn't have any structures that interfere with the total carbon storage on this site. And that's important to, to sort of note in your mind um, that when we're talking about a non-standard site, we're talking about all of these things. So concrete areas, picnic, benches, trails, buildings, um, streets, that all significantly impact how much carbon could be stored on that same area of land. Because remember, we're gonna get carbon as grams of carbon per meter squared. And if you have all of these things, it's gonna significantly impact that number. So for your own sample site, <clears throat> I want you to think about it now. What, what sample site are you going to be training or teaching at? So what does it look like in your mind? What is nearby your school or training area that might lend itself to collecting vegetation data in order to calculate carbon storage? So you're gonna click on the link in the chat for this um, Padlet. 
and you're going to type in your description of your site, and then you're going to be able to give and get feedback in order to ensure that you know what protocol e-training to follow up with after this workshop. So if you do want to get trained in the carbon cycle um, protocols after this workshop, this will help you. So as you can see here, I put in the description of where we do our teacher training. Um, the University of New Hampshire College Woods is a large natural area with native trees and a nearby brook and a few trails. And so it is a standard site, it's contiguous vegetation. And if you're really unsure, type over here, I am not sure I could use your help and you type it in and we will type into the comments and help you out. Remember, put that link right into your browser window. And you can type in what your training or teaching site might look like. Great, a few people joining us now. So far we've got someone from the state of Rhode Island, someone from the state of Indiana. Someone has a nearby nature preserve, that's great. A park near a train station. Ooh, we've got a screenshot, awesome. That's actually a really great way to think about this is what does it look like from above? a school property bordering state forest. So Henryville, Indiana, you may have the opportunity to do either a non-standard site on your school property or a standard site um, in that nearby state forest. Um, especially if you've got permission to, to put up a flag or two in there, um, which can be a great opportunity. Um, Peggy Folletta, a retired teacher on our team this year, uh, she was telling me about how she would always take her students on a field trip to a natural area to put together a standard site. Um, but they would also do a non-standard site in their schoolyard for comparison. So that can be a really interesting study. Good, Hoover High School um, also was thinking something similar. <clears throat> Good, Providence, Rhode Island. Yes, you'd definitely be a non-standard site if you have limited green areas. Um, but it can, be, it can be interesting to study just the planted non-native shrubs and trees. Um, the vegetation on these non-standard sites does not have to be native. It could even be invasive species that you're measuring. They still store carbon, um, perhaps a different amount, amount than if it had been the, the natural trees that existed there, but not necessarily. Great, so I'll keep this, <clears throat> you can keep adding your thoughts um, and I'll let Haley check in on it ever so often and see if there's any questions that come up that need answering. So for today's site, we're gonna <clears throat> focus on that site I was describing to you. So this is a standard site in New Hampshire. It's next to the university. Um, but it's area that's largely been left undisturbed, except for a few um, woods trails, like the one here in the middle of the screen. And so you can see it's mostly evergreens. And this is important. Take a look down here. You'll notice we largely have a clear understory. There are not a lot of small saplings, not a lot of shrubs, and not any herbaceous material. And that will become important later. And just like um, 
our friends did back in the Padlet a moment ago, you can see I also took an aerial shot. And these dotted lines are that same trail from the side view. And we put our plot in here so that the trail did not interrupt our forest carbon estimate. So based on what we just saw, you can now use the protocol decision tree. So once you've decided approximately where you're gonna put your plot, um, your sample site, you can go through the decision tree and figure out what exactly you're gonna measure on your site. And there's a different decision tree for the non-standard sites, but it works in the same way. So the first question is, do you have trees greater than 15 centimeters circumference on your site? So today's answer would be yes, because we had a lot of trees. We follow that down. Do you have any shrubs or saplings on greater than 25% of your sample site? And the reason why it has to be greater than 25% is because trees store a lot of carbon. Trunks, <clears throat> the, the stem of the tree is where most of the carbon is stored. And so if we have a completely forested area, unless shrubs and saplings take up more than 25%, they're not gonna significantly impact how much carbon is being stored there. So in this case, we did not have shrubs and saplings that took up that much of the area, so we're gonna say no. And then do you have herbaceous vegetation on greater than 50% of your sample site? So same thing, herbaceous vegetation does not have any woody components and therefore is gonna have only a small impact on, on carbon storage if you're comparing it to the trees that it sits under. So in this case, we'd also say no. And so we're just, going to be measuring and calculating carbon storage using the trees on our site today. And that's that College Wood site as is our example. So where do we go next? We know we need to measure tree circumference. We now know what our sample site area is like. We're doing a 30 by 30 meter square for College Woods today. And now we have to kind of get from here to here. So how do we actually get carbon storage for an individual tree? Oh, well, we have to calculate biomass. What is biomass? Right, so that's not a word that we typically use all that frequently. So let's talk about it for a minute. So the study of biomass um, <clears throat> is important to terrestrial ecologists. Um, biomass is the total mass of all living things within a given area. So it gives you the units of grams of mass, or grams per meter squared. And biomass is 50% carbon by dry mass. So uh, dry mass, let's imagine a one meter square area of grass and we've cut it down. So we don't have hardly any grass and we pick up all the grass and we carry it inside and put it in our drying oven and dry it. And then we pull it out and we weigh it, and that's our dry biomass. And then we take that and multiply by 50%. And that value is the amount of carbon in the grass that you're holding in your hands. So that's an important concept that carbon is 50% of the dry mass of all the living things within a given area. And on a global level, when we talk about biomass, um, we're talking about <clears throat> terrestrial biomass. If you um, took a look at the global carbon cycle. Plants are listed as 560 petagrams of carbon being stored across the globe. And you may have noticed that there were no animals included in the carbon cycle diagram because the vegetative biomass of the world far exceeds that of the animal biomass. And so on a global scale, it doesn't make sense to include those animals. However, some people wanted to know a little bit about the underground portion of carbon. Soils, on the other hand, um, store almost three times as much carbon as plants. And part of that soil carbon storage is all the microorganisms that exist there because you cannot separate them out. But that is, they are a huge contributor to the carbon storage in soils. And sort of the last, 
point to consider about biomass is that understanding local plant communities and what types of plants are actually present um, and how much biomass they contain, contain provides really important insights about carbon storage at that micro scale level. So your work and students work is important in understanding that, to that total picture of carbon globally. So how are we gonna study biomass today? Biomass units is a learning activity that we've developed. Um, part one is a concrete section of the activity where students calculate biomass of the classroom in grams per meter squared. So you mass all the people, you take the area of the classroom, and then you can get grams per meter squared of biomass. And then you can do some thought exercises like what would happen if you put all those same people in a closet? Well, the biomass would go up per meter squared. But if you took those same people and put them all in a gymnasium, your biomass would go down per meter squared. And that's important because it kind of gets us to start thinking about how does vegetation store carbon and how does the distribution of vegetation across an area of land impact how much carbon is there. So we're going to take a look at biomes in just a moment. And we're going to rank the biomes from greatest to least biomass and compare our guests to available scientific data. And then we're going to do a little bit of an estimate about how much carbon storage might actually be there. So um, Haley's going to put a link in the chat for our Jamboard. So that was your original KWL was in that Jamboard. And then up at the top, you're going to see a little arrow where you can go to the next frame. So you click next frame. You go to frame two and there is the global biome map. At the bottom, you'll see there's a key um, for all the biomes of the world. And we want you right now to take your pen and draw or circle the area on the map that has the highest plant biomass. Which biomes of the world do you think have the highest plant biomass? I see someone's weighed in already. Don't be shy. See a few people's pens going. Jump right in. I see lots of people in here. Use that pen and just put in your guess. You can't be wrong because we don't know who you are today. Great, someone's highlighting our Southeast Asia region of tropical and subtropical moist broadly. Someone's highlighted our uh, Amazon region. Whoops. <laughs> that happens, don't worry. I noticed that someone has highlighted the temperate region of Europe, as well as the sort of the <clears throat> temperate conifer forests or often considered considered the temperate rainforest of North America. So after you've done highest, you can go to the third frame and put in what you believe to be the lowest area of biomass in the world. Which biomes have the lowest plant biomass in the world? Lots of people keying in on that uh, Northern Africa desert and the Middle East deserts. Mm, some highlights on the Australian desert, as well as, ooh, a question mark up in Greenland. Someone has also circled Antarctica regions.
and maybe even a little bit of the subtropical tropical grasslands in with those deserts. So let's let's take a look. How do your thoughts compare to what scientists have actually measured on a global scale? So this is a different resource. So you'll notice that they've, these scientists have called this the ecosystem types, and they have slightly different titles than what was in the biome map, but that's <clears throat> mostly semantics. So if you look here, you notice tropical rainforests, in fact, do have the highest plant biomass of all the biomes across the world. So 40,000 grams per meter squared. So lots of people were guessing the tropical rainforest and then also the temperate evergreen forest was the next closest. And then some people had guessed this, um, the forests of Europe, those temperate deciduous forests. And those people who had questions on Greenland, that's the rock, ice and sand component up here, only 20 grams per meter squared of biomass. And that um, the tundra a little bit lower in those Arctic regions, as well as the desert scrub, both come in at about 600 grams per meter squared. So you can see how you might be able to use this to estimate how much carbon is stored in the sample site you described area earlier for your own area. So just kind of do this thought experiment on your own for a minute. Which biome do you live in? Are you planning to do a standard or non-standard site? Remember, the standard site might be closer to the value that's here, while a non-standard site, of course, is going to have buildings which change your grams per meter squared. So how much less do you think it would be? Obviously, I can't answer this question for you today, but if you write down your thoughts, um, maybe when you actually do this work um, with your teachers or students, you'll be able to have a number to compare it to. So now for our purposes of today, what do you think is a good biomass estimate for today's example? So remember that picture we saw, college woods and the Northeastern United States. And I want you to type your estimate into the chat. So where do we live? Which biome was that in the Northeastern part of North America? And based on what you saw in the pictures, what do you estimate the mean plant biomass to be? Great, I see somebody participating down there. Thank you, Anne, for jumping right in. Does anyone think that our local biome where, where Haley and I are, are gonna have more or less, more or less plant biomass for our biome? Or are they gonna be right on the money? You recall, we did have a number of evergreen trees that I showed you pictures of. Yes, and I did say that, you're right. <laughs> so it, we are in a temperate deciduous biome, but there were a lot of evergreens. Great, so keep, keep thinking about this question. We are gonna see an actual value today when we do our analysis. Oops. So, Um, so here we are, um, we have completed this section here, carbon and its relationship to biomass. And so now we know how to get biomass and we know, or we know what biomass is and we know how to get diameter, but how to make the connection between the two. This topic is called allometry and it's a really interesting study if you ask me. Um, allometry is the relationship between the part of an organism and its whole. So humans have allometry, um, but so do trees. So how do we actually measure trees and their biomass if we don't wanna chop them down like my grass example earlier? We don't wanna just take the whole tree and then put it in the drying oven 
and then expect that it's still going to be storing carbon on the field plot because um, it won't be. So scientists have done this work actually over uh, a number of years. Uh, foresters, forest ecologists, even um, logging studies have allowed um, researchers to use the wood to calculate the relationship between diameter at breast height and the biomass of a tree. And there are consistent relationships. And in particular, the exact relationship um, varies by tree species groups. And someone mentioned growth rate of trees earlier. Those species group relationships between DBH and biomass are primarily dependent on both the cell layout patterns of the different types of trees and the growth rate, so how fast they actually grow. And both of those things together impact wood density. So wood density is actually the driver of these allometric relationships. So we'll talk more about that in one second. Over here on the right, there's a graph that shows that. But just for a second, I want to call your attention to part one of the allometry activity, which is, again, an opportunity for students to concretely measure their height and arm span and foot length to show the relationship between living organisms' parts and their whole. So students actually create their own allometric relationships for their bodies, which is a fun exercise and really gets at the point of um, trying to understand what allometry is and how it works. Uh, luckily, those relationships are linear. Um, and so any student that's taking algebra can understand them. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> Allometric relationships for trees are actually not linear, as you can see in the graph on the right. So part two of the allometry activity um, is set up to help students understand this um, relationship and how um, to read this graph and understand what's going on with their own data. So the graph on the right shows diameter at breast height on the x-axis in centimeters. It goes from zero centimeters to 50 centimeters. On the y-axis is predicted biomass in kilograms, and it goes from zero kilograms to 1,600 kilograms. And then each line on the graph, each curve really, represents the relationship of DBH to predicted biomass for 10 different species groups. And these species groups are based on their wood density. So you notice that group one is maple, oak, hickory, beech. So they all have a similar wood density. And um, woodland species have a very different relationship between um, DBH and biomass. So what's particularly interesting about this data is it actually comes from a meta-analysis study that used a hundred different studies um, and developed allometric relationships for trees across the United States. But what's interesting is at the very beginning of her paper, Jennifer Jenkins and her team note that this compilation of equations was needed in order to better understand biomass and carbon storage at a national scale, but that other countries have already completed similar national scale assessments. So if you are not in the United States and the trees on this species group list don't look familiar to you, that doesn't mean all hope is lost and you should abandon the workshop now. Um, it means that very likely foresters and forest ecologists in your area have done this work as well. You might just have to do a little bit of digging um, or talking to someone local to find these relationships. So, how do you take a look at this graph? So let's make sure we know how it works. So if you had a tree that was in group one, the maple oak group, and you measured it outside to have a DBH of 30 centimeters, what would its predicted biomass be? So you went out to your field site and measured a tree that was 30 centimeters, and you used your species ID guide and found out it was a white oak. It's in group one, 
what do you think its predicted biomass is based on this graph? You can enter that in the chat right now. No sleeping on the job here, people. We encourage you, as we encourage all students, to engage their mind in the work. So can you figure it out? I see a couple of people weighing in at 600 kilograms. What do you find? Did you get something slightly less or something slightly more? See if you can read this graph along the bottom. I'm going over to 30 centimeter or 30 centimeters DBH. And then following it up all the way to group one. And then I'm coming across here. And it looks like the people who have entered their responses into the chat. Don and Becky and Pachara and Anne all around 600 kilograms, 550 plus are right on the money. So if you got that in your mind, even if you didn't put it in the chat, you're right on track. So remember these relationships are defined by density. Excellent, thanks, Jort. <laughs> okay, so here we are, we've gone all the way through. We are now out at our field site. We've collected tree circumference on all of our big trees. We didn't do any measuring of shrubs, saplings, or herbaceous material because we didn't need to, according to our protocol list. And we have our total sample site area that we know. So we are ready to think about analysis. It's great. And we have about 12 minutes left to do that. Um, oops. Let's... So, Remember, this is what our site looked like. And <clears throat> you don't need to go to this link now um, because I'm gonna show, there, show you what's there and we're gonna walk through it. Um, but I wanted to let you know, we have a link in this presentation so you can find the analysis template. It's kind of way down buried in our materials, but this is a great way to remove the black box. So what am I talking about? In Globe, when you enter your tree circumference data and your sample site area, all the work is done for you. You don't have to do any thinking and it's just going to give you some carbon numbers. That might be great for the age of your, the students, but it's not so great for teacher, for trainers and teachers, um, and even some of our high school students. Um, we should do a little bit more thinking, a little bit more analysis to understand what is it that's going on in order to understand why any of this matters. So let's take a look at our analysis. So when you first come, and I haven't pre-opened it for you, there's tabs along the bottom, and the first one says instructions. And it really is a walkthrough guide of instructions about how to do exactly what I'm about to do, to explore the data, to see what's here. <clears throat> so I'm not going to walk through that now because we're just going to do it. Tab two is your plot size or your sample site size. And you'll see here that I've put in 30 by 30 for today. So our total plot size at uh, College Woods is 900 meters squared. And then tab three is where we've entered our field data. So you could have um, printed out the data sheets and done them by hand in the field. You could have taken out a tablet with you and used an online data sheet and just typed everything all in already and then copied it and pasted it here. So you notice we have um, the year 2012 is when this data was collected. Um, and then we have data for each tree on the sample site. And so for each tree, it has which quadrant it was in and its number. That's just how we cho chose to name them. There's a description of that in tree mapping protocol. Um, we've identified the species group, and I'm going to give you a tool to do that in just a second. And we've actually measured its circumference at breast height. 
So along the bottom, if you click over, there are more really helpful tabs. We're gonna to go to tab eight for a moment. So in tab eight, um, we'll see here that you have all of your species groups and all of the individual species that are in them. Um, but what's great is you can use the find some function. So however you do that on your computer, so I do command F on my Mac and I can enter in a tree species if I'm not sure where it falls. So I can type in <clears throat> hemlock and I see fur hemlock pops up and then I can see that it's one out of 26. So I can go down to the next and a balsam fir is in there. And I can, oh, Carolina hemlock is in the fir hemlock category. Eastern hemlock, oh, that's the one I have around here. So for my Eastern hemlock, I'm gonna use the fir hemlock species group. Well, you may say that's fine and great because you live in the United States, but let's just take a look at some of the data that you might have collected. So these are, some of you folks, and here is your data about your species. And this was a great example from Argentina. Um, so uh, Marta knew that she had an Acer rubra in her area. So I can go back here and I can type in Acer, maybe. And I can scroll down you find it? Okay, so some of my Acer um, or maples are in the maple oak category. Sacarum, no, that's not the one she said. Acer, Acer. Oh, there's a Acer rubrum. So we actually have a red maple that is um, very similar to the red maple in Argentina. It's in our soft maple birch category. So Marta could use the soft maple birch um, species group uh, allometry for her tree. If you couldn't do that, say for Thailand or Taiwan or any of those other Southeast Asia trees, um, you might need to, again, find your local forester. So then what do we do with this information? The species group allometry, tab six, is where we find the actual equation that's being used so for every tree to get the biomass, um, it uses the same equation, the exponential function of the coefficient B0 plus B1 times the natural log of the DDH. And then for each species group, here are the coefficients. So for the aspen alder group, here are coefficients B0 and B1. And remember, these are related to these curves. These curves are created by that equation. Biomass equals the exponential value, dot, dot, dot. So that's what these curves are defined by. Um, as a quick note, somebody asked about underground. Um, these are two graphs that you can investigate on your own time. But essentially, what's important to know is that we can divide our um, biomass into its components. And we actually have coefficients built in to this spreadsheet that allow you to do that. So you can determine how much biomass is and carbon is stored in foliage, stem wood, stem bark, and coarse roots using this spreadsheet, which might be an interesting study for some uh, students. There's also an equations examples tab. So if you weren't quite sure how the spreadsheet worked and you were more familiar with using a calculator, um, we have this example here that shows you the spreadsheet equation and the calculator equation. So this is how you would type the exact same info into your calculator. So here we are for hemlock. We have our coefficients. We put them into our calculator just as you would any mathematical equation. And we've gotten 345 kilograms of biomass. 
And then we can scroll down and find that we've got almost the identical value in the spreadsheet. And then up in the formula bar, you can see that it's that same equation we just looked at. So it's kind of a double check for you. If you don't trust the spreadsheet, you can do it on your calculator and get that same answer. So now where is our data for College Woods? So we'll come back to this summary table in just a moment. But for now, we're gonna scroll down and check out our data. So here we are, this blue over here is our field data that we just copied and pasted into this page. And then over here are our coefficients. So these are the same coefficients for the fur and hemlock and they automatically populate when you type in fur hemlock over here, these coefficients come up. And then here's all our calculations, circumference to diameter. So circumference divided by pi. There's our equation with the coefficients and dBH included to get kilograms. And then we convert to grams and then we get grams of carbon. So this very small 15 centimeter circumference tree has 1,911 grams of carbon stored in it. And then if we add up all the trees on our plot, <clears throat> their total biomass is 31,441,392 grams of carbon is stored on our sample site in College Woods. And then of course we can do multiply by 50% to get the carbon stored. But in reality, if we want to be able to scale up to a larger area, we would divide by that sample site value and get grams per meter squared. So does anyone remember what we estimated for our biomass in College Woods? I think if we scroll up in the chat, we'll find it. People were estimating 27,000 for deciduous forest, but then Anne upped the value to 30,000 because we had those evergreen trees. So here we see 34,935 grams of carbon per meter squared in our College Woods forest. So that's actually a pretty close estimate that we can get to. And <clears throat> what's really interesting is that, about that is that it allows both you and your students to see that you can do, you are tree scientists, you are carbon cycle scientists, you can make these connections yourself and that your data is comparable to other data that scientists have collected worldwide. Um, and it really um, allows you to also get an idea of what would happen if you started cutting down trees. So you could even play with the spreadsheet. Someone asked a question yesterday about deforestation. So what if I just went in and did a clear cut? Well, all of a sudden my carbon would go to zero for that plot. But what if I did a selective cut and then left some stuff on the ground for saplings to grow in? How would it change the carbon storage? So these are interesting questions that can be done um, either theoretically just thinking about them or because you have the data in the spreadsheet, um, you can do some of those exercises in real time with um, older students or more advanced students, I should say. So where does that leave us? Um, it leaves us kind of back to what have we learned um, about our question. Remember our question was how do differences in tree species and sample site type affect carbon storage near where I live? So you can go back to that original Jamboard, frame one. So if it's still up in your browser, you can click back on it. And if it's not, Haley will put that link back in the chat. So you can get back there. And then you can start adding your sticky notes over here. What did you learn about answering this question? Are we able to answer it with the knowledge we gained during the workshop? Good. 
good. Someone's realized that seasons don't matter necessarily, especially for a um, forest ecosystem. But of note, if you were um, if you were doing this during on an herbaceous site, you might want to think carefully about what season you are performing um, these <clears throat> uh, protocols in. So definitely check out the herbaceous protocols and think about how a different season might impact your herbaceous material. Because we don't use allometry for our herbaceous protocol. Good, someone got some clarification about standard and non-standard sites. That was one of our goals today. So thanks for noting that. Good, learned some things about the actual calculations and biomass and the uh, logical nature of it and that non-standard sites may store less carbon. These things are all really important. Anything else that you learned today about how differences in tree species and sample site affect carbon storage near where we live? Ah, that tree species do in fact make a difference in how much biomass is stored. Absolutely. Um, and I did forget to mention, there's actually a nice little extension activity um, at the end of the allometry learning activity that allows you to do some density experiments with students if they don't have a lot of experience understanding density. And it's just um, taking blocks of wood that are the same size, but are of different species and running a simple density experiment. So it's a great way to get students engaged with a physical science topic um, in the realm of life science. Good, I think that conifer trees store more biomass. Um, so you would wanna go back and look at those diagrams um, and then per tree, the relationship is such that uh, for a given size, it's actually our hardwoods that store more biomass and carbon. But those conifer ecosystems on the whole, there's something different about them. So when it, it depends on which scale you're looking at. That's a great question. I'm glad you put a question mark on that. So individual hardwoods store more carbon, but um, conifer forests tend to store more carbon across the whole landscape. So unfortunately, we are out of time today. So I just wanted to point out something as you're on your way out here. And uh, first of all, this will be up for the rest of the day. If you want to take a picture of it or add more ideas, um, you can do that at any time today. We won't wipe it clean until the end of the day. So feel free to add and take, take screenshots. And then our last thing I'll say today is um, here are some great students from Maynard High School. Uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. They participated in the SRS, uh, in the GLOBE SRS in 2019. And their research question was, how does the uptake of carbon by schoolyard vegetation compare to emissions of carbon? So they used um, our protocols for a different kind of question and um, they got to present. So there are their smiling faces and you could read more about their project on the GLOBE website. So thank you all for being here and um, we're really happy you could make it. And remember, if you have any lingering questions, you can type them into that Mentimeter um, we pointed out at the beginning and you can come to the GLOBE protocol question and answer session tomorrow. I also wanna thank uh, Mike Jabot and Jen Bourgeau for jumping on and um, 
being supportive halfway through here. So see you all soon. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, the protocol question and answer session is tomorrow at 9 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. You'll be able to find it in the meeting platform. Um, we do have a keynote speaker starting here in five minutes, so make sure to hop over to that session. Um, otherwise, have a great day, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Thanks all. so much. Bye. Sarah, I really appreciate it.